People say that human beings are free when they obey reason alone and not animal desires. Or they say that freedom means being able to determine one's life and actions according to purposes and decisions. Nothing is gained by such claims, for the question is precisely whether reason, purposes and decisions exercise control over human beings in the same way as animal desires. If a reasonable decision arises in me of itself with the same necessity as hunger and thirst, then I can but obey its compulsion, and my freedom is an illusion. Another turn of phrase puts it thus, To be free does not mean being able to will whatever one wills, but being able to do what one wills. In his Atomistics of the Will, the poet-philosopher Robert Hemmerling expresses this idea incisively, quote, <clears throat> Human beings can certainly do what they will, but they cannot will what they will, since their willing is determined by motives. They cannot will what they will. Let us look at these words more closely. Do they contain any reasonable meaning? Must freedom of the will, then, consist in being able to will something without having grounds, without a motive? But what does willing mean other than having grounds to do or attempt this rather than that? To will something without grounds, without motive, would mean willing something without willing it. The concept of motivation is inseparably linked to the concept of the will. <clears throat> without a determining motive, the will is an empty capacity, it only becomes active and real through the motive. Thus it is quite correct that the human will is not free, inasmuch as its direction is always determined by the strongest motive. But it is absurd, in contrast to this unfreedom, to speak of a conceivable freedom of the will that, allows, that involves being able to will what one does not will." End quote. Even here, only motives in general are discussed, without considering the difference between conscious and unconscious motives. If a motive acts upon me and I am forced to follow it because it proves to be the strongest of its kind, then the thought of freedom ceases to have any meaning. Why should it matter to me whether I can do something or not if I am forced by the motive to do it? The first question is not whether I can or cannot do something once the motive has operated upon me, but whether there exists only motives of the kind that operate with compelling necessity. If I have to will something, then I may even be utterly indifferent as to whether I can actually do it. If, because, my character, because of my character and the circumstances prevailing in my environment, a motive were forced upon me that my thinking showed me was unreasonable, then I would even have to be glad if I could not do what I will. It is not a question of whether I can execute a decision once it is made, but of how the decision arises within me. What distinguishes humans from all other organic beings rests on rational thinking, activity we have in common with other organisms. Seeking analogies for human action in the animal kingdom does not help to clarify the concept of freedom. Modern natural science loves such analogies, and when science succeeds in finding among animals something similar to human action, it believes it has touched on the most important question of the science of humanity. Paul Ray's book, The Illusion of Free Will, offers one example of the misunderstandings to which this opinion leads. On page 5, Ray states, with regard to freedom, quote, It is easy to explain why it appears to us as if the movement of the stone is necessary while the donkey's will is not. The causes that move the stone are, after all, external and visible, but the causes by which the donkey desires are internal and invisible. Between us and the sight of their activity there lies the donkey's skull. One does not see the causal determination and therefore imagines that it is not present. The will, we say, while it is the cause of the donkey's turning around, is itself undetermined 
it is an absolute beginning. End quote. <clears throat> Here, too, is an utter disregard for human actions in which the human being has an awareness of the reasons for the action. For Ray explains, quote, between us and the site of their activity there lies the donkey's skull, unquote. We can see from these words alone that Ray has no inkling that there exist actions, not a donkey's but a human's, for which there lies between us and the action the motive that has become conscious. He proves this again a few pages later when he says, quote, We are not aware of the causes by which our will is determined, and so we imagine that it is not causally determined at all. Unquote. But enough of examples proving that many fight against freedom without at all knowing what freedom is. Obviously my action cannot be free if I, as the actor, do not know why I carry it out. But what about an action for which the reasons are known? This leads us to ask, what is the origin and the significance of thinking? For without understanding the soul's activity of thinking, no concept of the knowledge of anything, including an action, is possible. When we understand what thinking means in general, it will be easy to clarify the role that thinking plays in human action. As Hegel rightly says, quote, thinking turns the soul, with which beasts too are gifted, into spirit. Unquote. Therefore, thinking will also give to human action its characteristic stamp. This is by no means to claim that all our actions flow only from the sober deliberations of our reason. I am far from calling human, in the highest sense, only those actions that proceed from abstract judgment alone. But as soon as our actions lift themselves above the satisfaction of purely animal desires, our motives are always permeated by thoughts. Love, pity, patriotism are springs of action that cannot be reduced to cold, rational concepts. People say that the heart, the sensibility, comes into its own in such matters, no doubt. But heart and sensibility do not create the motives of action. They presuppose them and then receive them into their own realm. Pity appears in my heart when the mental image of a person who arouses pity in me enters my consciousness. The way to the heart goes through the head. Love is no exception here. If it is not a mere expression of the sexual drive, then love is based on mental pictures that we form of the beloved. And the more idealistic these mental pictures are, the more blessed is the love. Here too thought is the father of feeling. People say that love makes us blind to the beloved's flaws. But we can also turn this around and claim that love opens our eyes to the beloved's strengths. Many pass by these good qualities without noticing them. One person sees them and just for this reason love awakens in the soul. What else has this person done but make a mental picture what a hundred others have ignored? Love is not theirs because they lack. Love is not theirs because they lack the mental picture. We can approach the matter however we like. It only grows clearer that the question regarding the nature of human actions presupposes another, that of the origin of thinking. I shall, therefore, turn to this question next. <clears throat> 